Good morning. On behalf of LMI, I wanted to take a moment to express our appreciation to the UVA School of Data Science and the Global Women in Data Science Initiative. Thank you so much for hosting this program and for fostering women as data science leaders and experts. LMI is a proud supporter of WIDS. We have more than three dozen members in our own corporate community of practice, and some of our members participated in the March 2nd WIDS events held in Washington, D.C. and Austin, Texas. While we're unable to replicate that in-person experience today, I'm really thankful to UVA for their extra effort to make today's program available virtually, and to all of you for enthusiastic participation. It's going to be a really great day. I'd also like to thank Dean Phil Bourne and Associate Director Arlen Burgess for their hard work on this program and for being such incredible teammates to LMI. We're proud to be the school's only corporate partner who exclusively serves the federal government. We provide solutions leveraging expertise and of course, data science, as well as advanced analytics, logistics, digital services, and management advisory services. At LMI, data science allows us to take large incongruous data sets and paint a picture that helps our customers make sense of their data and with these insights make better decisions. Operationalizing these insights is always the goal, whether we're supporting enterprise data management, inventory planning to enhance military readiness, or currently the immense challenges arising from the current pandemic. I'm confident we'll work closely with the School of Data Science on these and many other endeavors. Our recent joint efforts from the January workshop on data ethics to LMI's engagement in providing meaningful capstone projects have been very rewarding and I hope mutually beneficial. We're also very excited to see the program's recent alumni bringing their talents to LMI, and we look forward to further establishing LMI as a preferred destination for the School of Data Science graduates. So Dean Bourne, Arlen, thank you again and keep up the great work. On that note, I'm pleased to introduce our opening keynote, Dr. Francisca Bell. She is the Senior Director of Accelerated Materials Design and Discover and Machine Assisted Cognition at Toyota Research Institute. Prior to Toyota Research Institute, Francisco was the Director of Data Science, Head of Platform Data Science at Uber, where she founded the Anomaly Detection, Forecasting Platform, and Natural Language Platform teams. Francisca carried out her postdoc at Caltech, where she developed a novel, highly accurate, approximate quantum molecular dynamics theory to calculate chemical reactions for large, complex systems, such as enzymes. Francisca earned her PhD in theoretical chemistry from UC Berkeley focusing on developing highly accurate yet computationally efficient approaches, which helped unravel the mechanism of non-silicone-based solar cells and properties of organic conductors. Through these experiences, Francisca developed a wealth of data science expertise and insight about being a woman in the field. We're excited to hear more from her today, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Francisca Bell. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this event today, and I would like to thank all of you uh, for joining in. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about how human AI collaboration can be used to scale innovation. Um, the talk is uh, sectioned into three uh, parts. Um, I will start by providing you an overview of Toyota Research Institute. Here, a particularly important takeaway is the concept of AI augmentation and not to replace the human. This then provides the foundation of human AI collaboration, which can be used for accelerating innovation. In the second part of my talk, I'll be showing how human platform collaboration can yield faster innovation cycles in the research domain. In particular, I'll be uh, diving into one of the divisions of Toyota Research Institute more deeply, which is the Accelerated Materials Design and Discovery, or AMDD platform uh, for short. The team is building a platform that utilizes machine learning in combination with computational chemistry to augment researchers in the lab in developing batteries and fuel cells more rapidly. Whilst this is a specific application, it is a good case study for how to scale innovation in a research setting more broadly. In the final part of my presentation, I will share insights from building data science platforms across a wide variety of different areas, such as forecasting, anomaly detection, natural language, and product experimentation, and how these platforms can augment business stakeholders data scientists and software engineers to yield both faster and higher quality data science results at scale 
in particular in an industry setting. In the next few slides, I will give you a brief overview of the Institute, in particular its mission and give concrete examples of the core principles of human machine collaboration, which sits at the heart of this company. Toyota Research Institute at a glance is Toyota's R&D operation in Silicon Valley. It was established in January 2016 and now has around 300 employees. Most employees previously worked in academia, government settings, industry research labs, or tech companies. Our institute has three sites, Los Altos, California, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, these are within close proximity of some of the universities that we're closely collaborating with, including Stanford, University of Michigan, as well as MIT. Speaking about university collaborations, about 20 million of our annual budget is used to carry out sponsored research collaborations with universities. Through Toyota AI Ventures, which is a subsidiary of Toyota Research Institute, we also support entrepreneurs innovating in autonomous mobility, robotics, data, and the cloud. TRI has also become a global sponsor of the Paralympic movement. Next, I would like to cover TRI's mission, which is something that personally resonates with me deeply and was one of the core reasons that I joined the Research Institute a few weeks ago. The TRI's mission is to improve the quality of human life through advances in artificial intelligence, automated driving, and robotics. In particular, two of the research institute's three focus areas are driving, robotics, and exploratory research. The latter category of exploratory research consists of three subdivisions, accelerated materials design and discovery, machine-assisted cognition, and the university collaboration program that I just mentioned earlier which spans across all of Toyota Research Institute. Today, we are going to deep dive into portions of driving and accelerated materials design. So let me give you a brief overview of the robotics and machine-assisted cognition areas first. The robotics team is developing robots that are able to assist and augment humans in the home. In particular, it will allow older generations to age in place longer. The machine-assisted cognition team or MAC for short, is the latest research area of Toyota Research Institute. The goal of this team is to understand and predict human behavior and to utilize this capability for good. One core principle that underpins all these areas is to enhance human capabilities and not to replace them. The goal is to harness the strengths of the human and the AI respectively, and to work together as teammates resulting in superior results. This is an often overlooked concept in applications of artificial intelligence today, where the stated goal is often to replace the human. One out of the many concrete examples of human AI collaboration that the Toyota Research Institute is working on is the so-called Guardian project. Guardian aims to amplify human control of the vehicle and not to replace it. In particular, Guardian's goal is to correct for human mistakes and weaknesses while striving. Note that this is quite a different concept compared to typical level two autonomous systems where the human guards the AI. Here, the AI guards the human. Think of this as the ultimate version of Toyota Safety Sense. With Toyota Guardian, the driver is meant to be in control of the car at all times, except in those cases where Toyota Guardian anticipates or identifies a pending incident and employs a corrective response in coordination with driver input. The eventual goal here is to create a car that is incapable of causing a crash. Let's look at a video that shows Guardian in action. This was shot at the Michigan Toyota Research Institute track. As you can see on the right-hand side, the car is driving down the road and then suddenly a car emerges between parked vehicles. Guardian here identifies a pending incident and employs a corrective action as a response. And you can see here what is happening in the test car itself. So as you saw on the previous slide, 
Toyota Research Institute develops Guardian to save lives. In addition, Guardian can make driving more joyful than ever. Let's look at a video to illustrate this. Imagine driving on a winding road similar to this challenging slalom cone uh, line on the test track. With Guardian turned off, you can easily clip a cone as you can see here in this video. But now with Guardian enabled, the driver feels in full control, maneuvering the car as an extension of themselves. Guardian is there to coach them and if necessary, to catch them. No matter what the input is that the driver gives, they will never, never oversteer nor understeer and will never clip a cone. So let me give you a peek underneath the hood. The idea I showed you on the previous slide was inspired by modern fighter jets. When you fly the stick of a fighter jet, you do actually not fly the control surfaces directly. The vehicle is actually on purpose dynamically unstable, so it is highly maneuverable. Instead, the pilot's intent is translated by a low-level flight control system that stabilizes the jet and stays within a specific safety envelope. With Guardian, we're aiming to apply the same idea, but for ground vehicles. Compared to the jet, this is much, much harder to do because for ground vehicles, the envelope does not only involve vehicle dynamics, but also perception and prediction and interactions between the vehicle and other vehicles on the road. With this so-called blended envelope control, the driver feels 100% in control of the car most of the time. However, as the driver gets close to the edge of the safety envelope, Guardian nudges the driver back into the safety corridor. Note that blended envelope control is a seamless blend between human and AI, where the human and machine work together as teammates, leveraging the best skills from each other. So as you can see from this concrete example, there are many benefits to human AI collaborations. In addition to the aforementioned, an important point is that Guardian can be launched without the need for full self-driving capabilities. So a key takeaway here is that we can have a lot of impact by building a solution that is not fully autonomous. While Guardian is a specific application for driving, this concept can tra be translated to many other applications of data science. Other productionized systems and in industry exist that actively leverage human AI collaborations. One example that I'm showing on the bottom left hand side slide is customer care, where customer support agents work with an AI hand in hand that understands the incoming text from a customer inquiry and provides suggestion on the inquiry topic, the potential actions, as well as the potential responses the customer care representative could take. This greatly increases the efficiency of customer support. At the same time, the customer care representative sits still in the driver's seat and has the final say. Similar to Guardian, this system has lots of impact, even though natural language understanding is still an open research problem. Another example is shown on the bottom right-hand side slide, and that is in financial goal setting. Here, forecasting systems have been developed that can generate sophisticated at-scale forecasts that would be time-consuming to build by humans. The human expert can use this baseline forecast to accurately uh, predict um, the, the, the various different areas of information. In addition, the system allows for what-if scenario modeling. However, the human can augment the system now in this baseline forecast with additional knowledge the AI might not have or has a hard time to accurately predict. For example, uh, what would happen to the company's bottom line if we were to double the marketing spend in a specific region? So next time, when you get tasked with building a data science solution, ask yourself the question, is there an opportunity for human AI collaboration? And as a result, can we launch the system prior to being perfect on its own. Next, I would like to use the example of the Accelerated Materials Design and Discovery or AMDD platform as an example for enabling human platform collaboration, which can greatly increase the innovation speed of researchers. 
The mission of the Accelerated Materials Design and Discovery Team is to create tools to accelerate the development of new materials for zero emission mobility, in particular batteries and fuel cells. A rapid transition toward electrification is being driven by both needs for a more sustainable future, as well as consumer demand, as you can see on the very right-hand side. AMDD's aim is to enable this transition. On the left-hand side, you can see one of Toyota's six environmental goals by 2050. The goal is to reduce global average CO2 emissions during operation from new vehicles by 90% from Toyota's 2010 global level. Note that emissions reduction is more than just CO2. As you can see in the middle picture, pollution can also result from particulate matter. Particulate matter pollution is five to 10 times deadlier than auto accidents worldwide. So let's look at a high level overview of the AMDD ecosystem, starting from the bottom and working our way up to the top of the slide. A small cross-functional team of computational and theoretical material scientists, machine learning experts, and software engineers build and maintain the platform capabilities. This team also encodes their knowledge into the AMDD platform, where it becomes available at a push of a button. Through the AMDD platform, researchers in an adjacent sub-area who may not be experts in the field of computational material science or machine learning now have push of a button access to tools in computational material science and machine learning expertise. The platform users often contribute experimental results and data back to the platform, augmenting and strengthening the central hub. In a nutshell, the human AI collaboration via a platform built by domain experts allows for rapid and scalable extensions of domain expertise into new areas that are complementary and critical in speeding up innovation in a multidisciplinary area. Let me give you two concrete examples of how the AMDD platform accelerates research in material science. The first one is BEEP, also known as Battery Evaluation and Early Prediction Tool. The software system is being used right now to manage ongoing experiments with battery cycling and has a number of key capabilities built into it. The first capability is rapid assessment of battery lifetime. Whenever a new battery material or manufacturing process is developed, battery performance needs to be tested. This typically requires batteries to be charged and discharged until the end of their life cycle. The goal of BEEP is to cycle the battery only about five times and still get a good indication of its lifetime. Whenever we need to validate lifetime after making a change in the battery design, we can now accelerate the testing as we only need a few hours of testing instead of weeks. This results in very large speed up in battery development. The second feature of this system is closed loop optimization. Here the system decides and executes the next experiment in order to optimize the given objective function faster. We have demonstrated this capability on designing new charging policies that extend battery lifetime and new policies were identified about 15 times faster than other methodologies. Finally, automation of experiments. We have 400 channels of testing and BEEP ensures that humans do not have to worry about the day-to-day -day management of data and experiments. The system is cloud-based and flexible so we can easily share data in real time and update models on the fly as new experiments come in. This work is being carried out in collaboration with Stanford and MIT and has resulted in publications in journals such as Nature Energy and most recently also in Nature. A second example I would like to share is CAMD, which stands for Computational Autonomy for Materials Discovery. Why build CAMD? The hypothetical material structure space is extremely large. To this day, most approaches are to traverse this vast search space uh, brute force, even when machine learning is used for assistance. 
This makes discovery of new materials extremely slow. However, science as we know it is an iterative process of trial and error and involves learning from mistakes to improve hypotheses. The question that CAMD poses is, can we actually include these aspects into a fully automated process, thereby resulting in significantly faster materials discovery? As a result, CAMD aims for cost-effective optimization in large, high-dimensional search spaces of materials. During the campaign setup, the researcher inputs the list of elements they're interested in. For example, they put in manganese and sulfur, as you can see in the picture here. They also input the objective, for example, thermodynamic stability and other parameters, such as cost constraints. CAMD then adopts a sequential agent-based approach to decide which experiments to carry out. Thereby, the AI agent can make use of past knowledge, heuristics, thermodynamics, and different exploration exploitation strategies. It does the step recursively, as you can see on the very right-hand side of the slide, each time with added knowledge of recent experiments. At the bottom left, you can see the performance of various agents that were trained to discover inorganic materials, in this case, iron-based compounds. The graph shows number of discovered inorganic materials as a function of experiments conducted, in this case, computational experiments. Similar to a typical machine learning problem, a database of known iron-based compounds was split into a training and a test set and the agents were tested on their abilities to discover the already known inorganic materials from the holdout set. The best performing agent was then deployed on a range of different systems, such as manganese sulfur compounds. The results of each iteration can be seen in the figure on the bottom right-hand side. To date, this autonomous platform has found over 350 new stable or nearly stable inorganic materials. Next, I will show you how the concept that we introduced in the previous section of expert platform collaborations can be extended to many areas of applied data science. And I'll show you how this can be done in particular in an industry setting. The goal of data science platforms is to accelerate one or multiple steps of the typical four-step data science lifecycle that is shown here on the slide. The four-step project lifecycle starts off by data exploration, followed by iterative prototyping. Once a good model is found, it gets productionized. Of course, during rollout and post-rollout, we want to actively monitor performance of the model, for example, using product experimentation. This closes the first generation loop of any data science project, and with the insights gathered from the monitoring phase, one can then start with a well-informed second iteration if necessary. Before we go into how tools and platforms can accelerate one or multiple of these four steps, let's talk about how we can accelerate the life cycle stages and therefore uh, the innovation by investing in data and the right data science team. Let's start with data because without data, there is no science. The way I think about data is like growing a garden. It needs constant attention and grooming. This is very important because otherwise data scientists have to over and over again deal with data fundamentals. For example, poor data quality or data discoverability issues. Many data scientists tell me that dealing with data issues can take up as much as 70% of their time. So investing early in a solid data foundation can have compounding positive effects. Next comes the exploration stage. Here, my strong suggestion is that data scientists also perform product analytics. This has many advantages, even if there are data analysts on the team. As data scientists performing data analytics tasks, you will stay close to the business, the product, and the user experience. And this very, has very large effects on the model choices you will make. I have observed many times in my career 
data scientists that jump right in to building very complex and challenging models. However, they have not considered the business problem at heart and fully understood it. This often results in unnecessarily complex models that fall short in exactly those areas that were most important to the business and uh, to have those addressed. As a result, these models often suffer, suffer from poor adoption. My advice therefore is to fully understand the business use case first and then adopt a launch and iterate mentality. This means to start with the simplest approach first. This may be just a heuristic. It might also mean that no machine learning algorithm is required at all. In my opinion, a good data scientist is a partner to the business, a partner that happens to know lots of statistics, machine learning, and software engineering, and is therefore uniquely situated to understand when data science is best applied, but also when it is not. Another reason for data scientists to carry out product analytics work is that it elevates data analysts to equal partners, which is important to me personally, but is also very critical to team health. Next comes the iterative development stage. Here I found data science best practices extremely important. Of course, data science best practices are important at every stage of the life cycle, but it stands out particular in the iterative prototyping phase. Because data science is a nascent job family, there are no best practices across the industry. So I encourage you to develop best practices in your companies, or if you're a student, in the companies you will join in the future. You don't need to wait for your leaders to implement these. I've seen great bottoms up efforts on this front. When it comes to data science best practices, I have found that heavily leaning on engineering best practices, especially software engineering best practices, which are widely adopted across the industry works best. This includes, for example, checking in code and getting it reviewed by both data scientists as well as software engineers, or having technical documentation that is also reviewed by peers. This and various different other best practices allows for high quality assurance as well as reproducibility. When it comes to productionization, more and more companies across the industry invest in so-called full stack data scientists. These are data scientists that also write production level code, for example, in Python. There are many advantages on this front. From a developer velocity standpoint, it allows to move directly from prototype to production. You're not being delayed by waiting on, uh, until engineering resources free up uh, that might be working on other things right now. And this could delay the project by multiple weeks, perhaps even months. It also helps to identify viable algorithms early in the process, already in the design phase, because what might look good on paper might not work well in practice, especially at scale. Another advantage is that any handoff errors that might happen can be mitigated. And finally, monitoring. That is a tax that both developers as well as data scientists really do not like to pay. Here, the philosophy I suggest is to make the right path the easiest path and automating as much as possible. As mentioned earlier, the goal is to accelerate each one of these four steps. There are many tools available to help accomplish this. These may be open source, third party, or uh, first party tools that companies build themselves. For example, in the exploration phase, companies often create tools uh, such as data books that capture the meta information about the data, such as data lineage, as well as data freshness. Also data visualization tools can be very helpful at this stage. Similarly, in the production, uh, productionization step, there are many machine learning platforms available these days to accomplish this task faster and with less under need for understanding lower level infrastructure expertise. But really the ultimate goal should be to provide data science capabilities at a push of a button uh, where the acceleration not only happens in one of these four steps that I'm showing here on this slide, 
but where all four phases are part of a single platform that provide an end-to-end -end so solution for a particular data science area. So let me give you a concrete example of forecasting. Let's imagine Alice, and Alice is part of the marketing team, and she's asked to solve a forecasting problem. She first manually extracts the data, visualizes it, cleans it, identifies variables that will likely be important to include, such as marketing spend. Subsequently, she tries out some forecasting algorithms. She compares them by performing back tests and also looks at their computational runtime. She selects the most appropriate forecasting approach or ensemble of forecasting approaches, then productionizes these, rolls them out, and monitors their performance on real world data. As you can see, this project takes a lot of time and likely the data scientist needs to build a lot of these capabilities from scratch. In a real world setting, time is often pressing. For example, the chief marketing officer needs these results for their meeting with the CEO. Now at the same time, imagine Bob. Bob is a data science team as part of the operations organization. He also needs to solve a forecasting problem. He first manually extracts the data, visualizes it, cleans it, identifies variables that he think will likely be important. For example, both marketing spend, but also holidays. Then he tries out some forecasting algorithms. He's mostly familiar with traditional statistical approaches and due to the lack of time, omits testing on machine learning uh, methodologies. He performs backtesting using a different error metric and also different time horizons compared to Alice. He selects the most appropriate forecasting approach he determined based on his conditions, productionizes it, rolls it out, and monitors its performance on real world data. Then he hands the results to the COO for the meeting with the CEO. I hope this simple example illustrates to you why it can be highly beneficial to invest in end-to-end -end data science platforms. There are three major reasons. Firstly, consistency and best practices. The CEO in my example will most likely receive different forecasts from the CMO and the CEO, creating confusion and lack of trust in future results. In addition, platforms also allow for introducing best practices. For example, for forecasting, backtesting is very important. Similarly, prediction intervals are essential, which give an estimate of the uncertainty of a forecast. Both Alice and Bob omitted prediction intervals in the report, and that is not atypical. The second big reason is efficiency. As you saw, Alice and Bob implemented the same major components to solve their problem, whilst they belong to different business areas. There are often very similar techniques that can solve multiple business problems. For example, forecasting is required across finance, marketing, supply demand estimation, and in some companies also hardware planning. And finally, scarcity of data science resources, in particular experts. Even at data science, um, even at companies where data science is extremely important, there's typically a very high ratio of stakeholders to few data scientists, data analysts, or machine learning engineers. Also, there are many flavors of data science and becoming an ex expert in a subdomain of data science, for example, forecasting or conversational AI can take many years. Data science platforms are a powerful way to obtain multiplicative effects. As we have seen in the AMDD example that I shared earlier, a small number of domain experts can embed their expertise in a platform that can be used by many, many users independently. So should we be platformizing all of data science? Building platforms is a heavy investment and needs to be carefully assessed, especially if it's done in-house. Here are three areas that I recommend to consider before embarking on the journey of platformizing a data science area. Firstly, can the platform create step function improvements to the user experience and the business? Secondly, the wealth of use cases. 
are there a large number of use cases across the business where the platform can be used? And finally, reusability. How easily can modules or the technology more broadly and its components be reused for a different use case? Here are some data science areas that have been successfully platformized in the industry, along with some example use cases. The most likely platform you'll encounter, especially if you're working for a consumer facing company, is a product experimentation platform to perform A-B tests or multi-arm banded experiments. However, very few experimentation platforms in industry today are truly self-serve. That means where a product manager or operations team member can complete an end-to-end -end experiment without the need for data science, data analysts, or software engineering support. I encourage you to identify opportunities to make this a truly frictionless experience. Coming back to our example of forecasting, one can build a forecasting platform where the only input required is historic data and the forecast horizon, as in how far you want to forecast out. One can build a platform where everything else is done completely automatically, including, for example, enriching the time series data with additional data sources, such as holidays, weather, or other events that are important to your company. Automatically pre-processing the data, which is an often overlooked step in forecasting. Pre-processing can be as important or even more important than picking the right model architecture itself. The platform can also automatically select the right algorithm or ensemble of algorithms from a suite of forecasting approaches by, for example, carrying out automatic backtesting. And with such a uh, forecasting platform, the forecasts can also be easily updated as new data becomes available. And finally, the platform can also provide quality assurance in near real time and also at scale. For example, by only publishing forecasting results that lie below a certain backtesting error threshold. A similar level of abstraction can be also accomplished for, for example, anomaly detection and even business analytics. In the final section, I would like to give a brief overview on strategies for commoditizing data science. Building platforms can take quarters, sometimes years. So how can one set up platform data science teams up for success, in particular in a fast paced business environment? The first key takeaway is do not build a platform and assume it will be adopted. This approach is prone to failure. More broadly speaking, adoption of a data science solution is often overlooked and it is very important and time, sent, uh, time intensive. It often requires at least, if not more time than building the technology itself. The best stra uh, strategy here uh, to building a highly relevant and adopted platform or really any data science project for that matter is being use case and customer centric. This means selecting a specific use case first that is aligned with the long-term vision of the platform, and then solving this specific use case by itself. Let's say a forecasting use case from finance. Subsequently, another use case is selected in a different area. Let's say forecasting in operations. At this point, if the platform is designed well, one can already reuse certain modules uh, for the second use case. For example, a backtesting framework for forecasting. At the same time, the second use case allows building new components to strengthen and augment the platform. Also, focusing only on one use case at a time and one user at a time, especially at the beginning, ensures that one can quickly react to any incoming customer issues and suggestions. There is nothing more powerful, really, than having a business stakeholder sharing the success stories from collaborating with the data science team. Now, with this in mind, I recommend a three-phased approach. In the first phase, embed domain experts with business partners in a specific area of the company. For example, finance. 
This allows the data science experts to understand the business problem very deeply and very importantly, understands their current pain points. It also provides the opportunity to tackle use cases right there and then, having immediate impact on the user experience and gaining trust with stakeholders. Also, as the data science experts will be likely using their own platform capabilities to speed up their consulting work, this also allows the data scientists um, to actually dog food their own nascent platform product and therefore to harden and improve it. Now, as we know, consulting over the long term is not very scalable. This is why you set out to build platforms in the first place. In the second phase, I recommend to build workflows. These are step-by-step -step instructions, for example, in the form of an IPython notebook that provides a template on how to solve a particular type of data science problem. For example, a challenging forecasting use case. This allows generalist data scientists who may not be as well versed in this particular domain to replicate the approaches and best practices. Now with this, there's already a small multiplicative effect in particular because the number of generalists uh, typically outweigh the number of specialist data scientists um, in a company by several fold. And the final step of course is building towards platforms that empower anyone to develop or deploy data science solutions at a push of a button that can enhance decision-making and the speed of innovation. The final concept I would like to convey on this front is the so-called area of path to integration, which I have found to be a vital tool for success when working on longer-term initiatives, for example, building platforms or carrying out research in particular in a fast paced business environment. As we talked about, building platforms and conducting research typically can take months, quarters, and potentially even years. At the same time, the business needs to make fast, iterative improvements to their product. So how can we still be agile whilst not stifling longer term projects and innovation? Here's where the path to integration comes in very handy. It deliberately allows for parallel efforts of short and long-term solutions. This allows for each team to work at their own pace and not to block each other at the same time. However, at the beginning of the initiative, the teams come together and commit to a timeline by when the short-term and the longer-term solutions will be integrated with one another. This ensures that in the long-term, the teams benefit from the platform concepts that we discussed, including, for example, um, minimizing maintenance costs. To minimize integration costs down the road, the teams also jointly design the system. This ensures that as each team makes their decision, they will architect towards a common solution versus accidentally designing solutions that will require an exorbitant amount of integration costs because they are divergent in nature. So in summary, we have covered two main concepts today. The first one is human AI collaboration, which is an often overlooked concept in AI applications today. As we have seen, it poses several benefits, harnessing the strength of both the human and the AI respectively. It also allows for the opportunities to have large impact, even if an AI system is not yet fully autonomous, for example, in the case of Guardian. But we've also seen that this concept is applicable to many applied data science and research areas as well. The second main takeaway is that one can leverage this idea of human AI collaboration to scale innovation. We talked about the benefits of building platforms which can lead to multiplicative effects. We also saw that platforms can be beneficial to increasing the innovation speed in both research as well as in industry. And finally, as platforms and research are longer term investments, they require careful implementation. And so I also discussed some strategies on how to successfully operationalize them. In closing, I would like to mention that we're also currently hiring. 
So please check out our careers website uh, that I listed on this slide here. And with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention.